Hello, my name is Ian Larkins of Radius Law and welcome to our commercial bulletin in association with LexisNexis. Previous case law has confirmed that in business to business contracts, it is acceptable to incorporate terms by referring to them on a website. But a recent High Court decision has flagged that this may not be sufficient for onerous terms. In this case, Blue Sky, a mobile network provider, contracted with a care home for mobile phones. Amongst the terms was an onerous term obliging the care home to pay a fee of £225 per connection if it cancelled. This charge to cancel all of the connections would have been £180,000. The court ruled that Blue Sky could not enforce its right to charge the cancellation fee because a clause which is particularly onerous or unusual will not be incorporated into the contract unless it has been fairly and reasonably brought to the other party's attention. The cancellation clause in this case was particularly onerous because it did not bear any relationship to the actual costs incurred by Blue Sky. The offending clause was buried within the body of the T's and C's and was cunningly concealed. And even if it had been incorporated, the cancellation clause would have been void because it was a penalty clause. All law students are taught that there are five key elements for any contract to exist. Offer, acceptance, consideration, intention to create legal relations and certainty of terms. Two recent cases, however, have shown that the courts may take a relaxed view on whether there has been acceptance. In Premier Marketing v Regis Mutual Management, Premier sought remuneration for introducing a client to Regis. There was no written contract and they had not even agreed the basis for calculating any fees due. Nevertheless, the judge found that there was a sufficient meeting of minds between the parties to constitute a contract. Since the contract was for the supply of services, a clause could therefore be implied into the contract under the Supply of Goods and Services Act of 1982 that Regis would pay a reasonable charge for Premier's services. In another case that concerned a long-standing supply contract which had never been in writing, the court decided that although exclusivity had never been formally agreed, there had been a common understanding of exclusivity which had then become a contractual term for some of the sales contracts. In Digital Capital v Genesis Mining Iceland, Genesis terminated its contract with Digital claiming that Digital had failed to perform but did not follow the contractual termination provisions that required it to first give notice to Digital and allow Digital the opportunity to remedy. Having failed to follow the termination notice provisions, Genesis' only option was to argue that Digital's failure was so serious that it should be considered a repudiatory breach, allowing Genesis to not need to follow the contract termination provisions. The court noted that the contract had allowed for any other right or remedy of either party in respect to the breach concerned. And without these words, it's doubtful that Genesis would have even been able to progress a repudiatory breach argument. Ultimately, in this case, Genesis failed. The court found that whilst Digital had breached the contract, the breaches were not so serious to deem them repudiatory breaches. As Genesis had not followed the termination provisions in the contract, the termination was not valid. The UK Competition and Markets Authority, the CMA, has published the Green Claims Code on the 20th of September. There are six core principles. Claims must be truthful and accurate. Claims must be clear and unambiguous. Claims must not omit or hide information. Claims must only make fair and meaningful comparisons. Claims must consider the full life cycle of the product and claims must be substantiated. The code is available on the government website together with guidance and a checklist. The UK Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO's data sharing code, came into force on the 5th of October. It's a statutory code for sharing personal data between controllers. Key points include a recommendation that a data protection impact assessment of DPIA is carried out even where there is no legal requirement to do so. 
to have a data sharing agreement in place. This is mandatory for joint controllers, i.e. where they jointly decide how to control the personal data that's used. A data sharing arrangement must contain policies and procedures that allow data subjects to exercise their individual rights easily. Extra care must be taken when sharing children's data. The High Court has provided a welcome judgment dismissing a trivial data protection claim. The claim related to a single email concerning a debt that was accidentally sent to the wrong person. The person who received the letter confirmed it was promptly deleted, but the correct recipient threw in everything but the kitchen sink with a multitude of claims. The court dismissed the claim, stating that there is no credible case that distress or damage over a de minimis threshold will be proved for breaches of this sort which are frankly trivial. The UK Supreme Court found in Coastal UK v Dunkley that it was unlawful for an employer to offer a pay deal to employees over the head of its recognised trade union, but it may have been acceptable if the employer had exhausted the collective bargaining process with the union first. In October, the Court of Appeal ruled on the Stewart Delivery v Augustine case, confirming that its couriers had worker status and so entitled them to minimum wage and holiday pay, amongst other statutory benefits. Unlike the Deliveroo case, the Stewart Delivery couriers only had a limited right of substitution. If the courier wanted to substitute him or herself, they had to apply through the company's act, and if no substitute was found, then the courier had to fulfil it or suffer the consequences of failing to do so. This limited right of substitution meant that the Stuart Delivery was unable to convince the court that the couriers were self-employed. A claimant that had suffered from a menopause with serious effects that limited her ability to carry out day-to-day -day tasks and who had been prescribed hormone replacement therapy resigned from her work after male colleagues had dismissed the fact that she had suffered from menopausal symptoms. She subsequently brought a claim for constructive dismissal. The tribunal dismissed the case, but the Employment Appeal Tribunal, the EAT, allowed her appeal and criticised the tribunal for concluding that her symptoms only had a minor or trivial effect. The claim has now been remitted back to a fresh ET to determine the issues of the case. Separately, the Women and Equalities Committee have held an inquiry into menopause and the workplace, but their recommendations are yet to be published. The case of Thompson v Scan Crown concerned Mrs Thompson's claim for indirect sex discrimination after her request for flexible working was refused. The tribunal decided that her flexible working request following her return from maternity leave had not been properly considered and that the team could have effectively operated covering the periods when she was not working. As it's generally accepted that childcare still falls predominantly on women, Mrs Thompson was able to successfully argue that given the imbalance of childcare responsibilities, the requirement to work full-time puts women at a particular disadvantage and that she personally suffered this disadvantage. Mrs Thompson was awarded £180,000. That's it for this month. Thank you for tuning in. We've included links to all of the documents we referred to today in a written version of this bulletin, but please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of my colleagues here at Radius Law for more information.